Hey there and welcome to Soul Church. Our prayer is that this message encourages you wherever you may be in life. Why don't you drop us a question or comment that you might have below? You know, we've been hearing so many uh, stories about what God is doing in people's lives and we'd love to hear yours. So take a second and send your story to stories at soulchurch.com. Thanks again for joining us today and we hope that you enjoy the message. God bless. Wow. You may be seated tonight. What an honor. What an honor to be here. Look at everyone in the house today. I was figuring it out. Actually, February the 8th, on February the 8th, 25 years ago, it would be this February the 8th, I left England with one suitcase with everything I had for a new life. Gave away everything else. Left with one. It was a big suitcase, but it was just one. And I left. Wow, it's great to see every one of you. It's great to be home. This is still home. Amen. Something really crazy happened to me for the very first time in my life. Coming through customs in Norwich, the lady told me that I had put British on my nationality and now I'm an American because I've got an American passport. And I was like, what? No, I'm still British. And so it's great to be. I think I've got a picture of my family. God has really blessed us. There's the family and Bentley, the the dog. He had to be in the picture with us. But blessed family from right to left on the back. That's Brittany, my 25-year-old servant in the Air Force, the U.S. Air Force right now. uh, That's Maddie, Luke, Hannah, Molly, then my beautiful wife. How many knows I'm part of the Overachiever Club? Steve Morstan is still the founder and the... um, the originator, president, and and then Judah in the middle. So that's really fantastic. So, hey, we're so proud of Soul Church and just everything that God is doing here. We keep in touch with you. We're so proud of the awesome journey that you're on and just John, Pastor John and Chantel and just the great job that they are doing here. And my challenge is this, jump on board. Jump on board, get involved. Don't be a spectator. You gotta be a participator. Because I've learned something about spectators. Here it is. Are you ready? They get cynical and they look for finding faults. But what did participators do? They roll up their sleeves. They get a part of the vision and they say, how can we serve? Come on, that's just the pastor inside of me. I'm sorry. Don't be cynical. Don't be fault finding. Get involved. And you may say, well, they need to do something better. Well, you do it. Sign up and make a difference. Come on, put your hand on your heart. We're going to pray as we go into the Word tonight. You're going to pray for yourself because as the seed goes, the Word goes out, it's got to hit the soil of your heart. Prepare your heart tonight. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you today for our hearts. And God, we pray that as your Word goes forth, it would bring forth life and truth to each and every one of us. God, we haven't come here to waste your time. And we know, God, you haven't come to waste ours. But God, we thank you tonight that you are awesome that you are incredible, and we just want to tell you, do a work in our lives like never before. We don't want to leave here the same. In Jesus' name, come on, shout amen in the house. Come on, high five two people around you and say, Liverpool's going to win the league this year. What? 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 The real Reds are going to win this year, amen. You know, during the month of January, we always like to take our church through into a new season. It's a new month. It's a new opportunity. And this month, we've been really encouraging people not to go for resolutions. Because the problem we have with resolutions is at the beginning of the year, they start strong and we're like gun ho you know, we're going to get in shape and we're going to go to the gym like 20 times a day or something. And then all of a sudden, two months later, we never go. So what happens is the resolutions start strong. We've got great intentions, but then they tend to die out. So we've been challenging our church to build habits into your life, to lay some foundations, to lay some things in your life that you can build upon, that you can pick up speed and momentum and see God do a work and a change in your life. And why is that? Here's the reason why. Are you ready? We are what we repeatedly do. You may not like that, but that's the truth because we form habits and then our habits begin to form and to make each and every one of us. So we've got to realize that we need to lay the right groundwork to build. Who's who's ready for a great year this year? Anyone? 
Man, if you, if you don't want it, I'll take yours. Oh, come on, I said, who's ready for a great year this year? You've you got to set the course for your life. You've got to lay the proper foundations. Here's what I've discovered as a pastor. Many people and most people have uphill hopes, but they have downhill habits. They have hopes they want to get in shape. How many knows round is a shape too? Just saying, just saying, just saying. They have hope, uphill hopes. They're going to go to the gym. They're going to begin to eat right. They're, they're going to build their marriage this year. They're going to see their family change. They're going to get a greater education. They're going to have a better job. They're going to manage their finances better. They're going to hope, hope, hope. Uphill hopes. But what I've realized is this. Hope is a good motivator, but it's not a good strategy. It will get you going, but it won't keep you going. And that's why you've got to develop and build your life upon habits. Set a course of implementation that will see your hopes and your dreams become realities. Oh, it's great to have hope, and we've got to have hope. But we've got to have more than hope. We've got to put action. We've got to put words. We've got to put feelings. We've got to put action. And, and we've got to move into these things in our lives. And so I ask you today, what are the habits, what are the things that you are placing in your life? Look at this scripture from Romans 12 and verse 2 from the Message Bible. It says, instead, fix your attention on God. Instead of perhaps who you turned to last year, what you looked for to be your source of strength and encouragement. Instead of what you tried and it didn't work. Instead, why not? Fix your, why not give God the opportunity to work in your life? Instead, fix your attention on God. Why is that? Because He will change you from the inside out. That's God's way. Resolutions can't do that. People can't do that, but God can. And then it says, readily recognize what He wants from you and quickly respond to it. Unlike the culture around us, I think this gives a great definition of where we live, the society that we're in, the culture around us, always dragging us down to its level of immaturity. But God, He brings out the best of you. No matter how dark the night, God is still the light that shines bright. And God still has a plan and a purpose for your life. And what does He want to do? He wants to develop you. He wants to form you. He wants to bring maturity into your life from the inside out, the best for your life. So today we're going to talk about a habit that we can build our lives upon that can sustain that. And here's the habit tonight that I want to bring to you. This was one out of a four-part series that we had in our church. But it's the habit of controlling my thoughts. Controlling my thoughts. We talked also about putting God first in our lives. We talked about aligning our life with purpose. We talked about choosing the right relationships, all important. But I'm telling you tonight, we're going to talk about controlling my thinking. Wow, we could teach a whole series on this because we've got some issues. You know, the biggest problem you have is not your neighbor, it's not your boss, and it's not your husband. The biggest problem is what's between your ears. It's your thinking, it's your mind. And for many of us, it's stinking thinking. Amen. If you were to reflect back on your life, you were to look back, the pivotal moments of your life were affected and changed when something happened. And that something was you changed the way you thought. The prodigal son in the Bible, he had spent everything. He had wandered away. He was in a pig pen. He had nothing. And the Bible says this. He changed the way he thought. He came to his senses and he said, hold on a second. I've made the wrong choices for my life. I'm going to, even at father's house, I may only be a servant, but there's food to eat. He changed the way he thought. He had a moment that was pivotal to changing his life. And every one of you. Perhaps tonight is that moment of pivotal change in your life where you can change the course and the direction of your life. Why? Because a changed mind alters the course of your life. It gives you fresh hope. It gives you fresh perspective. And then the real change can happen. Because when we begin to make the change up here, then we allow the real change. And the real change is from the inside out. And it's when God wants to change our hearts. A heart change. Look at this statement tonight. You cannot think 
your way into heaven, but you must have renewed thinking in order to make it there. You may disagree with that, but I don't. I can't think my way, I I think I'm going to be good, I think I'm going to make it. I can't think my way to heaven, nothing can get you to heaven apart from the blood of Jesus. And Jesus as your Lord and Savior. But we need a renewed mind in order to make it there. And we see that through the Word of God. Even after experiencing and expecting and having God into your life and Lord and Savior, your mind can be a major problem and a major hindrance causing a roadblock. Philippians 2, 5 and 8 says this, Let this mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus. I read that and I'm like, man, I need to note something here because if this is the mind of Christ, I need to discover what that is. And what do we see of Christ? He did not take on the form of God. He was God. He did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but he made himself, he made a choice. And the choice he made was to have no reputation but to take on the font form of a bond servant and coming in the likeness of man. And here it is. And being found in the appearance as a man. What did he do? He humbled himself. And he became obedient to the point of death. Even to the death of the cross. What mind is there in Christ? A humbled mind? A mind of obedience? I wonder if that's like your mind. I wonder if your mind is humbled and obedient and given and surrendered over to God. I'm telling you. It's probably not. But what you've got to realize is your life will never change until you change the way you think. It's not the doing that's really the problem. It's not that thing that you're doing that's the problem. That thing is only the product of your thinking. Ecclesiastes 10 and verse 2 says, Wise thinking leads to right living, but stupid thinking leads leads to a wrong life. Man, can you get it any more plainer than that? Any clearer? Wise thinking is good. Stupid thinking, not good. So controlling my thoughts will determine the pathway of my life. I want to give you three things about your thoughts, and then I want to give you some practical ways that you can help develop and build your thoughts. Is that okay tonight? So here's the first point tonight. Everything begins with a thought. Everything of life, your mind is the birthing point. Your mouth doesn't speak until your mind tells it what to say. Your heart doesn't beat until your mind gives it instruction. Everything in our lives begins with a thought. James 1 verse 14 and 15 says, Temptation comes from our own desires, our own thoughts, which entice us and drag us Away. These desires give birth to what? Sinful actions. And when sin is allowed to grow, it gives birth to death. In this passage, James is, is talking about where sin comes from. He talks about how God will not tempt us with sin because that's not what God does. But he gives to us the source of the problem that we face. And it's not the devil. He says the problem is our thinking. And the way we think, because our uncontrolled thinking conceives sin and produces the results in each and every one of our lives. We see it again in Proverbs 23 verse 7. It says, for as a man thinks in his heart, so he is, so he becomes. Notice now it's not me thinking only in my head. I'm now thinking in my heart because it's moved beyond a thought and it's now an action. It's now a word or something because it never just stays there. It is manifested out. And we see the process of what the enemy wants to do. And you may sit here today and say, man, I wish I could change my behavior. You can, but you'll never change until you change the thinking behind it. And God desires to change your thoughts. When he hung upon a cross, he was pierced through his hands. He was pierced through his side and his feet. But he also wore a crown of thorns. Why? He wore that thorns. His brow, his mind was pierced. His blood was shed. What? So we could have renewing in our minds. So we could have healing and we could have clarity. Romans 12 verse 2 says this. Do not copy the behaviors and the customs of this world. The King James Version says, do not be conformed. The thought is put in a box, a mold. The world wants to mold you. Did you realize that? 
It wants you to look like them. It wants you to talk like them. It wants you to think and act like them. The world's pressures are all around us every day. But God says, I don't want you to be put in a box. I I don't want you to copy the customs and the behaviors of this world. But God says, here's what needs to happen. You've got to be what? You've got to be transformed into a new person by what? By the way you think. God says, you've got to be transformed by having a renewing in your mind. Having a new mind. No longer controlled by your stinking thinking. I'm going to ask you a question tonight, and I don't want you to answer straight away, okay? But just listen. Where's the biggest attack that the enemy attacks you at? What's the greatest place that the enemy uses each and every day to attack you? I know what the answer is. One, two, three. It's the mind. It's your mind. Why does the enemy attack you in that place? Because he knows this. If he controls your mind... He controls you. 2 Corinthians 4 verse 4 says, In whom the God of this world has what? Blinded our minds. So what? We wouldn't see the light of the gospel. So many people today are blinded in their minds. They're coming to church. They're trying to live for God. But their minds are totally blinded. That They cannot see the truth and the freedom and the liberty that God has for them. Because everything good and bad begins with a thought. Here's the second point. What we think determines how we feel. Your thinking determines your feeling. Have you ever started, kind of felt like you were getting a head cold or something? You kind of started saying, man, I'm just not feeling too good. You start thinking that for a little bit longer and you're just in bed. You're not doing good. And then you can, if you don't watch, it can go on and on and on. Do you know this? I know a lady in Bridgeport, Connecticut. I could take you right now to her house. That lady is crippled in a hospital bed and the doctors have told her there is nothing physically wrong with you, but she lost the battle in her mind. She told herself she was defeated, that she would never be nothing, and now her whole body is acting as a result. Listen, your mind will determine the way you feel, the way you act, and the way you live. Oh, we're quick at blaming other people. That's the easy way. Oh, well, it's their fault that I'm feeling like I'm feeling. It's because of them, and we want to find ourselves in that way so often. But really, listen to me today. It's really not them that's the problem. It's your response to them, which is the problem. I can't make everyone like you, but you can choose to whether believe that or not. You can choose to allow that to come into you or not. It's how you respond matters. We need to put a filter on our minds. We need to filter our minds. How do we filter our minds? We've got to watch what we're putting in. Because what we're putting in is what's going to come out. And so you've got to watch what you're filling yourself with because you can't fill yourself with one thing and produce something out at the other end. You're going to produce out what you put in and it's going to be multiplied and it's going to be worse than what it was in the first place. And so you've got to be so careful With that, I I taught a whole message on this because, like I say, I've got six kids. And this is how it goes with your kids most time. Parents, you'll know what I'm talking about. Well, listen, I don't like you going there. I I don't like you hanging around with those people. I don't like you listening to that. And the kids would say, well, it's not really bad. Any parents heard that? Well, Well, it's not really bad. But the problem is, if it's not bad, it doesn't mean it's automatically good. Do you see what I'm saying? So we want to think if it's not bad, then it's got to go on the good column. But really, there's three columns, and the columns are bad, good, and God. Because it may not be bad for you, but that doesn't mean it's God for you. Come on, that guy sitting beside you may not be bad, but he may not be God for you. Come on, that music you're listening to may not be bad, but is it building your spirit? Is it edifying you? Is it moving in your walk with God? Is it feeding you in the right way? And here's my challenge. How many people do we have fasting in the house? Fantastic. We just finished our fast, so I'm enjoying you all. We're eating fruit and vegetables. I'm enjoying fish and chips, and I'm enjoying everything. I did it. 21 days, lost 14 pounds. Thank you very much. Found 28 since I've been here this week. But let me give you a fast if you want one this week. Are you ready? Go on a soul fast. 
I'm not talking about a soul church fast, as in soul church. I'm talking about watch what you are feeding your emotions and watch what you are feeding your spirit. What do you mean, pastor? Turn social media off for the week. Have you seen some people, man? We just did this in our church and we had some people coming in churches like this and we're like, what's wrong? They're like, man, I'm having withdrawal symptoms. What's wrong? Well, I haven't been on social media for seven days. No, you're gonna live, you're gonna make it. That was one of the greatest things I did on my fast was I went all off social media. Didn't have any connection to anything else. I turned the TV off, I limited what I watched, I limited what I fed myself. And I'm telling you, that was the greatest fast that I could do. I'm telling you, watch what you're putting in because your thoughts will determine your feelings. Look at the Bible tells us in Philippians 4, 8 and 9. It says, finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true. One translation says, fix your thoughts on that which is true. Whatsoever things are noble, just, pure, lovely, of a good report. If there's any virtue, if there's anything praiseworthy, what? Think on these. Meditate on these things. And what's the next verse say? And then the peace of God, or the things which you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, do these things and God's peace. The peace of God will be with you. You know why many people aren't walking in peace? <laughs> because of how we think determines how we feel. We haven't surrendered our mind over to Christ. Here's another point for you. You ready? Our thoughts will determine our destiny. Everything begins with a thought. Our feelings are determined upon our thoughts. And our destiny will be the result of how we think. You see, our thoughts determine the pathway that we travel along in our life. We, we can justify it as we do, and we can say, well, it's just a small thought. It, it's just something small. It's just something that's not really important. It's not going to damage my life. It's not going to cause any problems. But listen to me tonight. If you don't hear anything else, you need to hear this. That thought is plotting a course for your life. Yeah. I remember when I was um, 10 years old. I used to go to um, Beach Hill. It was now Langley Junior School. I went to Beach Hill. And, and I remember in um, geometry class, Mr. Cullingford. I remember one day Mr. Cullingford said, we're going to do something different. We want everyone to push your desks to the side. And he got out his big ruler and his big compass and protractor and everything. And he said, we're going to do something on the floor today. Instead of the board, we're going to do it. And I remember he told the story and he began to set the course of an aeroplane that was leaving London and heading towards New York. And he, he set all the course and it was heading at a particular course. And then he said halfway on the flight, something happened. And as a result, and he drew a new line and he changed the course by one degree, just by one degree. And then it went on to where its destination which was supposed to be. And over the course of travel from London to New York, with a one degree difference made along the way, that aeroplane missed its targeted destination by over 100 miles. One degree. And I've never forgot that because I thought, man, how easily just the smallest of degrees can alter, the smallest thoughts can alter the whole direction of my life. It can make me miss that place that God has for me, that person, that plan, those things. And thank God, God is gracious and merciful and He can readjust our lives. And maybe if you've missed that today, come on, there's another opportunity in God if you'll just surrender and give your life back to Him. But my thoughts are so powerful. Why? Because they are directional. I read this, look at this. You sow a thought and you reap an action. You sow an action and you reap a habit. You sow a habit and you reap a lifestyle. You sow a lifestyle and you reap a destiny. Notice how it begins, a thought. How does it end? A destiny. Your thoughts determine where you land, where you go, and where you are. You may sit here today and say, man, this is just like mind over matter stuff. This is like psycho babble stuff. This is not church stuff. Well, listen, I beg to differ because everything I've talked about is biblical. And I'll prove that to you right now. You ready? Romans 8, 5 and 6. Those who are dominated by the sinful nature think about sinful things. 
But those who are controlled by the Holy Spirit think about the things that will please God, please the Spirit. Look at verse 6. So letting your sinful nature control your mind will lead you where? To death. But what? But allowing and letting God, His Spirit, lead and control and guide your life. What's the result? Life and peace. Wow, wow, that's what I desire. That, that's what I want for my life. So I've got to watch because my thoughts are going to take me either where I need to be or away from where I need to be. So let's make it practical tonight. Is that cool? Let me help you to control and to help and to practice good thinking. And I'm going to give you five things today. Number one, I've got to find a plan. Say with me, a plan. I've got to find a plan to control my thoughts. A plan that will help me to develop and build godly thoughts. If I'm going to build godly thoughts in my life, though, the first thing I really need to do is find out what's the source of the bad that's coming into my life. Because I can come to church on Sunday and give my life to Christ and say this week's going to be different. But if I don't change my life, then I'm going to be in a bad place by next Sunday again. So I've got to look at the sources around me and what's feeding my life. I've got to cut the wrong supply. I've got to cut those things off. I've got to have a plan. And the plan isn't just moving forward. The plan is what do I need to release in order to go forward in my life. And I believe the best plan that you can have for your life is this. Are you ready? Read the Bible. Read God's Word. I believe as a child of God, you need to read God's Word every day. You don't have to read 20 chapters every day, even if it's just a verse. Don't read it out of obligation. Oh, I have to read the Bible. No, don't read it like that. It's a joy to be able, instead of having obligation with it, say, I get to read the Bible. Come on, and one thing I've discovered is this. If you really go to the Bible in the right way, you don't read the Bible. The Bible reads you. Because it begins to show you things, and it begins to expose things, and it begins to highlight things. I I don't know how many times in my life I've been reading something, and God says, there it is, Philip. That's the answer that you were looking for. So I'm telling you, every question you have in life, the answer is found in God's Word. It's not a history book of something that's old. It's His story. It's not history. It's His story. And His story, look what it says in Hebrews. It says, the Word of God is alive and it is powerful. It is sharper than the sharpest two-edged sword cutting between soul and spirit, between joint and marrow. But look what it says in the end. It exposes what? My innermost thoughts and desires. I I need to read God's word because I can discover truth that needs to be applied to my life. You may not have people who can help you every day and talk to you about God. But you can read God every day. Because his word is a manual. It's his love letter. It's his instruction book to each and every one of us, and it teaches us right from wrong. You want to be a better parent? Read God's Word. You you want to have a better marriage? Read God's Word. You want to be better in life? Read God's Word, because it will give you everything that you need. Let me challenge you. Get a daily reading plan. How many uses version? You have version? How many uses version? I use it every day. Love it. And one thing that's good about you version, it will even read the Bible to you. You don't even have to read it. It does it like for you. I mean, what? That's incredible. So read it. Number two. Say with me, number two. That was pathetic. Say with me, number two. Number two, number two, number two. That's Leeds, by the way, isn't it? Leeds and number two, is that right? Just saying. Find a place. Find a place to think your thoughts. Find a plan, and now find a place. In other words, I have to have a place in my life every day where I can turn down the world and I can turn up God. I've got to have a place. I've got to have a place. I really believe this. I believe it's important every day that we have a conversation with God. 
I believe every day it's so vital that you allow God to speak to you. We have problems with our prayer. And you know what our problem with our prayer is? We don't give God any time to speak. If we've got five minutes to pray, we pray for five minutes. We give God the shopping list and then we leave and we don't even give God the opportunity to speak back to us. Create space in your life when God can speak too. So if you're praying, cut down you and let God speak and minister to you. So what do we do? If we're going to find a place to pray, here's the best way or to think. It's to pray, to pray, to pray. The challenge we've given our church and we've got wristbands made and t-shirts. That's our slogan for the year and it's pray first. No matter what's going on in your life, pray first. When you're about to go into that doctor to get a test, pray. Before you put your kids to school in the morning, pray. When you get that email before you reply, pray. When you're going into that meeting with your boss, pray. Come on, you got to pray, 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 pray. Come on, I'm going to show my age now. Even MC Hammond knew what to do. Come on, hammer time with the pants down. Come on, you just got to pray just to make it today. But you got to pray. Some people get caught up in it. Oh, but pastor, I don't know how to pray. Yeah, you do. Just pray like you do talking to your best friend. What do you do with your best friend? You tell him your problems, what you're going through, the struggles in your life. Tell God the same thing. One of my favorite scriptures on prayer, I believe, is Psalms 145, 18. And it says, the Lord is near to all who call, but listen, to all who call to him in truth. I, I've been convinced of this. We lie a lot when we pray. Because we pray, God, thank you for this day. God, I think you're awesome and incredible. No, I don't. I don't like you today, God. I'm in struggle. Come on, be real in the house. Come on. We get like that. And that's how God wants us to come to him. God, I'm struggling with you today. I'm, I'm just struggling a little bit right now. But God, I know that you're life. I know that you're peace. But God, I just need to know that right now. Would you come? Come on, what prayer do you think God's going to respond to? Pray your way. Here's what I've discovered about prayer. It's more the quantity than the quality. It's more doing it. You know, we, we think I've got to pray for an hour at a time. I, I can't do that. I'll be honest with you. I'm a pastor and the confessions of a pastor. If I sit down to pray for more than probably 10, 15 minutes, I'm going to sleep. I'm, my mind's going crazy, going everywhere. That's just me. So you know what I do the best? I walk and pray. I get outside and I walk and pray because if not, my mind goes every which way. So I found the best method for, for prayer for me is short bursts just throughout the day. God, help me today. Help me right now in the name of Jesus. God, I'm going into this meeting. Help me right now. Is that cool? Is that cool? Yes. Isaiah 26 verse 3, you will keep him in perfect peace who trust in him, all whose thoughts are fixed on you. You see, prayer is a great opportunity for me to offload and to get my thoughts back on track. It's great to remind yourself who you're praying to because then you realize he's in control and I'm not. Yeah. And I've got to surrender my life and realize that he's got my life. Philippians 4, I don't have to be anxious for anything, but in everything by prayer. Say with me, by prayer, <laughs> through prayer. Pray first in supplication with thanksgiving. Let your requests be made known and the peace that goes beyond human understanding. What will it do? It will guard your hearts and your mind. Number three, find a person to stretch my thoughts. Find a plan, a place, and a person. I, I need a, accountability in my life. I need someone to help keep me in check. Uh, I am the man I am today because of Steve and Rachel and, and Graham and, and Mark and, and so many people, Mary, all the family and the people that were around me because if I wanted to go the wrong way, they set me back on track. You've got to be around the right people that are going to keep you. You see, the Bible says, even God said this, it's not good for man to be alone. God said, you need a helpmate. You need a friend. You need someone to do life together. Look at me, young people. Listen to me, everyone. Show me your friends and I will show you your future. You want to know what your future looks like? It's going to look like your friends. If they're not in church with their hands up, then they're going to be dealing drugs in the streets. Come on, they're going to take you away. Show me your friends and I'll show you your future. James 5 verse 16, confess your sins to each other. Some people don't like that. Well, no, I don't confess my sins to other people. No, you're not confessing your sins because they're your savior. 
really what James is talking about, that you get around other people and you say, what, you too? Me, me too. You, you, you go through that too? I mean, really? I, I thought I had to be perfect to come to this church. You mean you struggle with your thoughts too? You mean you shout at your wife too? What? You too? That's what it means, confessing. And then what happens? When you're real with each other and you share your heart and you pull down the mask, that was a series you had here, what can happen? Then you can begin to pray together and the Bible says what? Healing will come to your life. Healing and deliverance will come when you begin to allow other people in and you begin to allow them to support you and pray with you and stand with you and encourage you. Here's what I believe, life change happens in the context of relationships. God gave me this about two months ago, and I've probably quoted it a hundred times since then. And you can Twitter it, you can take it and say you came up with it, that's cool. <laughs> you need to surround yourself with friends for your worst day, not for your best day. On my best day, I don't need people. And if they're going the wrong way, I can stand because I'm good on my best day. But I've got to surround myself with people for my worst day. When I'm struggling and things aren't going good, I don't need other people who are struggling and things ain't going good. I need some people say, man, we need to be in Soul Youth on Friday night. That's where you need to be. Come on, I need some people to say, you need to be in church. You need to pray. I've got to surround myself with people for my worst day. Some of you need to make some changes in your friendship circles. You need to build some fences. You know what a fence does? It keeps what you want in and it keeps what you don't out. You need to put some people outside of your fence and you need to bring some people into your fence. And bring the people into your fence that's going to benefit your life and help your life and support your life. Hebrews 10, let us think of ways to motivate one another with acts of love and good works. I want that in my life. I want people who are going to motivate me and help me. And what does it say? Don't neglect our meeting together. You've got to be in Father's house. You need to be in church. But encourage one another, especially as you see the day of his return drawing near. Come on, we need each other. So what do we do? You need to get in a soul group. You need to be in a group. You need to be reading the word. You need to be in prayer. You need to be in a group. Get in a group. You need to be in a group. We've got t-shirts that we all wear that says, get in a group. Get in a group. Almost done tonight. Number four. Is this okay tonight? You've got to find a purpose to use your thoughts. A plan, a place a person and a purpose. One of the most heartbreaking things as a pastor, and Steve can testify to this, is people don't know their purpose. People are wandering around saying, what did God create me to be? It's so much easier to pastor people when they know what God has called them to be. But the enemy has put so much confusion in people's minds of what they thought they could have been, but now they can't because they've blown it. Purpose is crucial for your life. And it helps to direct your thoughts when you know the reason why you're here. Two of the greatest days of your life will be the, reason, the day you were born and then the day you discover why. That God has a purpose for your life. And you need to find that. Romans 12, 2, the last part of that verse says, Don't copy the behaviors and the customs of this world, but let God change the way you think. Look what it says. Then you will learn to know God's will for you which is good and pleasing and perfect. The number one question I get asked as a pastor is this, what's God's will for my life? What's God's will for my life? Discovering your purpose and what God made you for. Coming up in March, they're gonna be restructuring this. It used to be called Growth Trap, but you're gonna have Soul Track. Four weeks on a Sunday and you can get plugged in and they can help you to discover this church and the vision of this house, but they can help you to discover your God-given purpose and the plan and the place that God has and where you can serve and you can be part of a dream team. Why a dream team? Because you can live your dream. You can live your purpose each and every day. Number five, band, you can come back. You're probably already back on. Doing a good job, by the way, my man. Find a power. Find a power to fuel my thoughts. Find a power. As I mentioned, February the 8th, 
1994, I left England. February the 26th, 2004, I stepped away from a ministry position that I was in in Louisiana, Baton Rouge. I was a popular guy, had a lot of things going for me. Just everything was good. And I went from being a popular guy that everyone loved to a guy that people walked past me in the grocery store and wouldn't even talk to me. True story had neighbors and people who lived around me were part of a church that I used to attend and they just snubbed me and just wouldn't even help me or even acknowledge I was there. That was a tough time for me. But during that time, God gave me a vision of what church should be and what God had called me to do. And I hung true to that, but the vision was so much bigger than me. It it still scares me today, 15 years into it, it still scares me because it's still bigger. When we have Vision Sundays, just like with Pastor John next week, We can't give you the whole vision because it would overwhelm you. We've got to give it to you in increments because we've got to work towards it because you would think we would never be able to get there. But you're already sitting in a miracle today and you've got to realize that today of what God has done. But I'm telling you, God wants to do something in your life that's beyond you for what reason? So you realize you can't do it on your own. And what did God give you in order to do that? He gave you the power of His Holy Spirit. I've gone over time, so let me bring this to a close. We need His Holy Spirit. Acts 1 verse 8 says, You shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be a witness. In order to be that witness and to live that victorious life, come on, we need God's power to help us, to fuel our thoughts, to captivate and help our thoughts. Isaiah 55, 9, My thoughts are nothing like your thoughts, He says. And my ways are beyond anything that you could ever imagine. Why is that? Because there's a challenge for us. Do I want to stay in my thoughts? Do I want to stay in my ways? Or do I want to go to His ways? Do I want to think His thoughts? Do I want to live His plan? Well, if I'm going to get from me to Him, come on, I need the power of God. I need the power of His Holy Spirit to operate and work in my life. Here's my favorite scripture of all times, Ephesians 3.20. Now to Him who is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above and beyond. The Message Bible says, beyond your wildest dreams. But what is it? Come by the power. The power that we allow to operate inside of us. Could we stand all over this place right now? Would you allow God's power to come in? Would you allow God's power to change you, to renew you, to set you free? You see, when we talk about the power of God and we talk about the Holy Spirit, that freaks a lot of us out. Speaking in tongues and all that stuff, that's not, I I don't understand all that. I, I, I don't know, it just doesn't seem right. Can I explain it to you the right way? Who wants power to be victorious? Who wants strength to be a witness? Who wants to rise above the struggles and the problems you're facing in life? Who desires to have peace in your heart and victory in your soul? You know what that is? That's what the Holy Spirit wants to be. But the problem is how it's been packaged and how it's been presented to us. Would you bow your heads all over this place? talking about thoughts today thoughts today but the greatest thought that you need to know today is this do you know Jesus do you know Jesus because that's a question that you must have the answer to you can have the greatest status and the position in life but that means nothing because everyone is equal at the foot of the We've got to come through the cross to discover life in Christ Jesus. As every head is bowed and every eye is closed, do you know Him today? Is there anyone here that would lift up their hand and say, Pastor, would you pray for me today? I want to give my life to Christ. Come on, would you put your hands up all over this place? Come on, who's that? There you go. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Come on, is there others in the house? Just saying, thank you, sir. Come on, as you put your hand up, you can put it down. Is there anyone else? Thank you. There's another hand. Come on, there's hands going up all over this place. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. I want to pray for you right now. And I want to pray that God would save your life as you surrender it to God. You don't have to jump jump through hoops and be this perfect person, because if that's the case, I'm in trouble. But it's His grace and His mercy. 
and his forgiveness that we need. Come on, would we all pray with those who lifted their hands in this place together? Would you say, dear Heavenly Father, right now, I surrender my life to you. I give everything to you. And I pray right now that you would touch me, that you would change me, that you would make me anew. And from this day forward and forevermore, I'm going to live for you. I'm going to serve you in Jesus' name. Amen. Come on, put your hands on your minds right now. Just put your hands on your head. Come on, everyone in this place, just put your head, hands on your mind right now. God, we bring every thought into captivity right now. God, everything begins with our thinking. God, our feelings and our destiny is determined upon what we think. And God, I pray, God, through your word, through prayer, God, through people, God, through purpose, God, through the power of your Holy Spirit, God. God, I ask that you would renew my mind, God, that you would set me free, God. Today, I'm a new person. Today, my, my thoughts are not going to shape me in the wrong way, but I will discover my identity and what God created me to be. Today, I change my thoughts. Today, I think godly thoughts. Today, God, I live in victory. Today, God, I'm free in the name of Jesus. Come on, shout amen all over this place. Thanks again for tuning in. If you said the salvation prayer for the first time today, we'd love for you to email connect to faith yeah. at soulchurch.com so we can talk to you a little bit more about this incredible decision that you've just made. That's right. And if at any point in the service you felt moved to give towards our local and global initiatives, mm -hmm. please head over to soulchurch.com. Click on the giving at the top of the page. Thanks for being with us today. Hope you join us again soon. God bless. Okay.